Okay. Thank you. Thank you. How are you? I can't say how are you. So good to see you. Very good to see you. My name is Nadara Youssef. I'm the facilitator of the Global Governance Innovation Network and Global Youth Coordinator with Coalition for the UN We Need. We just had a brilliant panel on UN reform through the lens of gender equality. Um, started off a brilliant conversation and we really hope that that will continue into UN 75 and the week ahead. My name is Samyukta Setimadhavan. I'm a law student at the New York University School of Law. Today I am with many distinguished guests at the United Nations. Um, we had a roundtable discussion about the agenda for women's rights in the future. This also took place during Climate Week, which is currently present um, in New York City. Um, it was a very insightful discussion about um, women's rights, the international legal agenda, as well as um, how climate can be involved and how to take a very intersectional approach towards dealing with climate issues. Um, I would love to be involved in more events at the United Nations um, going forward and um, this was a fantastic first event for me to join and I had a fantastic time today. Community, for which I serve as a representative, the Coalition for the UN We Need, uh, for which I serve as a co-chair, and the uh, Global Women Leaders Voices for Change and Inclusion, of which I am a huge fan. Uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this important gathering during the UN General Assembly High Level Week, uh, entitled UN Reform Through the Lens of Women's Rights and Gender Equality. I've been given 30 minutes to open the session, but I'll reduce that to five. <laughs> I haven't been given 30. Uh, it's appropriate, I think, to begin this discussion with what the Secretary General said in his Our Common Agenda report. And I quote, perhaps humanity's greatest resource is our own collective capacity, half of which has historically been constrained as a result of gender discrimination. No meaningful social contract is possible without the active and equal participation of women and girls. Women's equal leadership, economic inclusion, and gender balanced decision making are simply better for everyone, men and women alike. I could not agree more with this assessment, of course, uh, and I might suggest two additions. The first is that the way our institutions are arranged must have gender equality embedded in their DNA. This will require a change in culture and programming as much as it will be a change in the percent of women in leadership positions or other outward indicators. Second, a world characterized by full gender equality is something that we have never yet seen. A world which not only provides equally for the needs of all people, but embraces the contributions of all people. And the UN is uniquely positioned both as a universal institution but also through its normative and moral voice to lead the way toward it. In this regard, I'd like to make three quick points. Firstly, the benefits of full and equal participation of women are now clear for all to see. Second, the qualities we wish to see can be manifested by both women and men. And third, the UN must harness these two facts in its reform process. On the first of these points, which I need not go into very deeply, but just by way of one example, in the early days of the coronavirus pandemic, Nations in which uh, women contributed more prominently to the leadership of society were seen to have generated uh, a degree of stability across a variety of short-term indicators, including public health and economic security. This capacity requires, at a minimum, increasing women's presence in roles of leadership in the affairs of society. But equally important will be raising up the qualities that women tend to bring to processes of problem solving and decision making. Qualities of leadership often associated with masculinity, things like assertiveness, decisiveness, competitiveness, have proven limited or even counterproductive, when not tempered with other attributes traditionally associated with femininity, such as compassion or humility, a tendency toward collaboration and inclusion, a willingness to change in light of new evidence, and perhaps most importantly, thinking about future generations in all decisions. Importantly, these attributes can actually be manifested by people irrespective of sex. And gender equal and women's rights aligned policies will yield benefits regardless of who promotes them. Moreover, I would suggest that the knock-on effects of a UN reform with a gender equal lens will reverberate to national and local governance as well and ensure that children, boys and girls alike, see girls as equals and women as leaders. This positive tipping point would be yet another benefit. Finally, UN reform requires a reconceptualization of systems and structure that will afford women and men 
opportunities to learn how to overcome barriers to full participation, like intimidation in majority male spaces, or norms that frame women's contributions in the context only of the home. Barriers ultimately to good governance and enduring peace. Now I'll leave off with a more personal narrative before passing the floor to Nadar. So growing up, I was a sensitive soul. I'd like to think I still am, but you'll, you'll let me know later. Uh, I'm quick to emote and once saw this as a source of weakness. Society often degrades such qualities in its conception of masculinity. Yet I've come to regard it as a gift instilled in me. While still a work in progress, as we all are, without compassion and empathy, I suspect I would be more likely to err in my dealings with others. It was recently the five-year anniversary of the passing of my father. I had occasion to read remarks that he wrote at my bar mitzvah, um, and we can talk about my religious journey another time. <laughs> but something that stood out was his gratitude to my mother for the qualities she was instilling in me, these traditionally softer qualities. And it's through these iterative steps towards gender equality, whether in a small family like my own, or a large institution like the UN, that future generations, including that of my daughters, will live in a world where it isn't remarkable that a man might cry or that a woman would leave. It's just a human being being human. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Dan, for those very welcoming, warm opening remarks. And I will come back to a couple specific things that you said. But to begin, good morning, everyone. And for those of us, those of you joining us online, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where it is that you're joining us from. Uh, my name is Nadara Youssef. I'm the facilitator of the Global Governance Innovation Network and Global Youth Coordinator with Coalition for the Young Meet. It is my true honor and pleasure to welcome you to today's panel on UN reform through the lens of women's rights and gender equality. And what a brilliant way, and what a brilliant lens through which to kick off the 75th session of the UN General Assembly. Because the purpose of this panel is to catalyze and by no means satisfy the ongoing dialogue on the need to put gender equality and women's rights at the center of UN reform and the implementation of the Secretary General's outcome agenda. Now I'm joined by a panel today whose collective Assistant Secretary General, Under Secretary General, UN representatives, civil society, founding and leading, and heads of state titles would both accumulate to more than the presence of many round tables that we'll see next week and completely fill up my script. So allow me to introduce, through the abridged, abridged version of their introductions, Her Excellency Ms. Helen Clark, the 37th Prime Minister of New Zealand, former administrator of the UN Development Programme and co-founder of Global Women Leaders Voices for Change and Inclusion. Her Excellency Ms. Susanna Malcora, a uh, former Minister of Foreign Affairs and Worship, Argentina, former Chief of Staff of the Secretary General of the United Nations, and member and co-founder of the Global Women Leaders Voices for Change and Inclusion. His Excellency, Mr. Donila Turk, former President of Slovenia, President of Club de Madrid, and member of the Secretary General's High Level Advisory Board for Effective Multilateralism. And Dr. Soon Young Yoon, advocate for women's human rights and author of Citizens of the World, Soon Young in the UN, United Nations Representative of the International Alliance of Women and Chair of the Board of Women's Environment and Development Organization. Could we please give a very warm welcome. <laughs> so Dan, coming back to some of the key remarks that you gave us, and just to set the scene for this panel as well. Um, you set an important context for our discussion on how UN reform both intrinsically and instrumentally benefits from a gender inclusive lens. And you also you know, mention this future generations thinking, the importance of the types of societies, the legacy we leave to our uh, successors. And we've heard a lot recently in General Assembly debates on the Our Common Agenda reform process about how the well-being of future generations transposes onto sustainable development, climate change, and other sort of high-level political agendas that we see today. So in that regard, Ms. Clark, you have been the administrator of the UN Development Program. You've looked at all of these sort of intersections of global agendas uh, through the lens of development, through the lens of sustainable development goals, more recently through the lens of pandemic recovery. 
So now I invite you to also sort of give us your insight through the lens of gender equality and how this additional um, sort of interface transposes onto the agenda. What are the key achievements, good practices and challenges in advancing gender equality across the UN in your experience? Thank you and uh, good morning everyone. Well, I think one should start by you know, giving credit where credit is due because for women, going back to the foundation of the UN and then the negotiation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, gender equality was written into that extremely important document in the sense that everything flows from that in a normative sense. And we owe a great deal to Eleanor Roosevelt who was there and banging the table for women uh, at, the, the found, at the conference, the, the draft of the uh, Human Rights uh, Declaration. And then you saw over the years the, the, the normative work build on that, not least with the negotiation on CEDAW, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. And then what followed with CEDAW was the uh, reporting and accountability mechanisms for uh, member states. So uh, th this is all very important. You move to the Commission on the Status of, of Women, the largest convening of, of, of women every year. The pandemic was a bit of a setback as with everything, but normally, you know, First Avenue is a buzz with the women of the world for two weeks of March, uh, March of the year. And then in uh, the organisational structure, you had initially UNIFEM, uh, which was a, an associated program of UNP. Uh, still, even when I came to UNP in 2009, uh, you'd have UNFPA, uh, Population and Development, which has played such a vital role in sexual and reproductive health and, and rights, a critical role for women. Uh, and then eventually the formation of, of UN uh, Women of somewhere around the 2010 uh, mark or, or so. Uh, so then you, because with the, when you talk UN, you're talking on one hand member states and what they negotiate and do, and on the other, what the organisational structure of the UN itself uh, it does. So if we come to gender equality and, and appointments of the UN, Ban Ki-moon was very exercised by this. He did not want to see uh, any shortlist for a senior appointment which did not have at least one woman on it. And he turned the shortlist away. There's no point going to him for the shortlist that didn't have a woman's name on it. So that set an important tone. And over time, uh, certainly in UNP, what became in practice was that right through every point of the appointment process, uh, you, you had women there. Uh, so there had to be women looking at the long list, women looking at the short list. Uh, women on the uh, interviewing panel, uh, women who are interviewed for the job, and, and then if it was the senior level appointments where I chaired the appointment panel, you were very conscious of having to have women's names that you could take to the secretary. Uh, so I, I think that set, set a good tone, and I'd be surprised if other organisations didn't go on the same uh, kind of, of, of journey. Uh, now, uh, I saw over the years uh, the, the pushback against women's rights and gender equality start uh, getting more, more noticeable beyond the usual suspects uh, of, of member states. So you would go to, uh, for example, the UNDP executive board with a gender strategy. You get pushback on the gender strategy because immediately there would be member states who would read into that. It's code for LGBTQI, which they didn't like. They didn't like women either, but you know, it was more easy to invoke LGBTQI and their uh, homophobic laws than it was to uh, be upfront about, about women. So this became uh, quite, quite problematic. And one also has noticed over the years that we have years where the Commission on the Status of Women cannot agree an outcome document because of the degree of, of pushback. And uh, when you have a you know, Trump-style presidency, let's be honest, uh, then uh, the U.S. joins other states in that, in that pushback. Uh, it becomes very unpleasant. On the other hand, you have an Obama presidency, Biden presidency, things go more smoothly from an agenda uh, perspective, uh, obviously. Uh, so, you know, one one observes all these things. I think. I mean, there's other points where the debate will come back to me uh, later. But I think. Uh, you know, the UN is a publicly accountable organisation and of course it has failings as we all know. It stands for great standards but then uh, sometimes um, you know, more of the breach than in the observance. So it's, it's had trouble with its peacekeepers, right? Uh, dreadful trouble with peacekeepers. 
that's had trouble with you know, sexual predators in, in its offices and among the staff. Uh, I mean, but, but you have to deal with it. And generally, it is dealt with it, and it's extremely uh, firmly. Uh, so, you know, those, those would be some of, of my observations. Of course, you know, there is still the commanding high person position at the UN, which is not yet after 10 Secretary General for a woman. And I really hope that next time, when I believe the term should come, must come to Latin America and Caribbean, that one of the incredible women out of that region, and there are so many who have done so well in commanding heights positions as foreign ministers, permanent reps in the UN, etc., one of them somewhere will, will emerge as, as the first female Secretary General. Because again, it's a question of being seen to walk the talk, isn't it? You can talk gender equality, but if a woman is always bad in the top job, you know, that, that's not good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Clark. Has there been sort of a journey there from starting a narrative to being more inclusive and thinking about, oh, we actually do need to include women in the, in the position of shortlist for roles, to being consultative, having women be a part of that discussion, um, to now where I think we're hopefully in a stage of at least some kind of partnership. But as you mentioned, there's, in the end, the UN is, is accumulation of member states and domestic forces do mean that there is something that is pushing that resistance against reaching the level of leadership of women at the high levels. I mean, in the end, we are in a country that is yet to see a female president. So, you know, it is, it is, so in the culmination that member states are, in fact, what make up the UN, how do we then move past these, these domestic forces to the institutional level? And, and as you said, Ban Ki-moon was one of the people that really tried to make a stand on this. We have someone here today who worked very closely with Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and was a part of all those shortlist discussions and, and kind of how to go forward on that. But you're now seeing, Ms. Malcora, an evolution of the UN by Antonio Guterres through the Our Common Agenda Report, and again, trying to push the envelope, push the narrative. So how can we ensure, based on your experience, that the UN reform process and the implementation of the Our Common Agenda, specifically, is not gender blind? Well, uh, thank you, Mara. It's very great to be here, and I want to thank Zahai for hosting us. Uh, it's really nice to, to be at a place where one sees so many good and, 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 and recognizable friends, faces of friends. Let me, let me start with a personal uh, a story about women's empowerment in the UN. I came to the UN through World Food Program. My World Food Program was the first place where I joined the, the UN. And I discovered the world of the humanitarian UN. And at that time, eh, we were implementing something that Catherine Bertini has started, which was that we were not going to deliver aid to the head of a household that was not a woman. You know, it, I was new to the UN, so this it sounded interesting, but why so much it focus on it? And then I read the data, and it was just amazing to see the difference of food loss in the ones who receive the food, or, or the aid at large, but not only food, were men instead of women. You will go to the market, and you will see in the black market, a around 10% of the food delivered being in the black market. When women started to receive it, it was close to zero. And what women will do, they will trade. For example, our kids did not have uh, soap. But women knew because UNICEF and the different WHO were telling them how important it was to wash hands. So they will pray food for soap for their children. So this was my first encounter in the field of what is the difference that women and men have to approach certain questions. 
I won't tell you what men use that money of the 10% loss <laughs> food, but you can well imagine. So it was shocking to me to get this real sense of a mainstreaming a gender perspective into programmatic questions. It's not about theory, it's about real life, it's about impact. So after this first encounter, I, I understood the importance of the role that the UN plays in, in these matters. The importance, and, and Helen referred to, to the history and the many positive milestones of history. So setting standards, setting the, the, this, this a larger perspective, how critical the role of the UN was, but also how exemplary and <coughs> well done the UN is. And let's be honest, sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. So here we are now going to, to your point on, on our common agenda. I think there is an opportunity here. I honestly would not give it for granted. So one of the reasons why we are sitting here, you know, why I preside over this group of women leaders, we are 61, all former UN senior staff, all former senior officials from governments who work closely with the UN. We have established ourselves because we believe the gender agenda has been weakened big time and not by chance that there is a coalition which I call an unholy coalition that is really against the advancement of this which has simplified the narrative to say women's rights versus family rights and that's what we have before us so the Secretary General with his, our common agenda faces that reality the reality that there is a pushback on, on, on the gender agenda. At the same time, as there is a, a concerted effort also to weaken the multilateral system. And by the way, I will argue that behind those two things, there are common actors. So we must be cognizant that nothing will happen just because it will fall from the sky. This requires work. It requires serious work. It requires us coming together, the ones that believe that this has value, that this makes a difference, and develop a narrative that is easy to understand, that makes it clear that we are talking about half the population not being fully represented. And then you can go to, to make the case on <coughs> the impact on GDP and the impact on, 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 on development. But that needs to be done. And I think we need to support Secretary General in these efforts. We are doing it as GAW, we co-chair, uh, uh, Dan referred to that, uh, some of these processes. We deeply believe in the UN. But we also need to recognize that the UN has to find a way to mainstream these issues in a manner that has an impact. And one of the things I find sometimes that makes me sad that through the competition for resources, often we lose sight of what is really important. The Review on gender architecture for me is one key pillar where we need to come to grips on who does what, when, where and put an end to this competition for resources in a very vicious way. And vicious not only because of the competition but vicious because it derails the attention from what the mandate should be. And let me start, and I won't go much longer, with you and women. We need to take you and women back to where we, you and women should have been all along. You and women is a cross-cutting, normative organization 
that oversees that these questions are properly implemented is not the implementer. But then this calls the attention to the donors that often only support projects. And then you have to become projectized in order to get resources. Yeah. That's exactly opposite to what the role of UN <coughs> women is. So we are going to continue to work. We are doing a lot in, in, in the processes. But our view is we need to go back to the definition of mandates that are there, mainstream those mandates, and put the money where the mouth is to make sure that we deliver properly, including the implementation, and I'll make a last reference here, to 1325, which we are all very proud of as a principle. We should not be so proud of as an implementation. So coming together, you know, establishing a coordinated narrative among the ones who believe in this issue, supporting the Secretary General in his many efforts, and he will have summits to, to bring this through, but provide clear support in a continuous manner, because this battle has not ended and is not going to end any time soon. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Ms. So Walker, for your very sort of real and honest um, awakening remarks, so to speak. And there's a couple things that you mentioned there that I want to quickly unpack. Um, in terms of sort of the data back to the sort of institutional mechanisms that you've seen that have worked. It also speaks to what Ms. Clark said earlier. It was just the case that you had to have a woman on every list. It was just the case that you had to give the funding to the women in the household. And that sort of small trigger makes a difference. But then the question becomes scale. It becomes sort of institutional impact and growing the narrative. And there, you know, as I think all of us in this room today are believers of, of gender equality, are believers of the feminist movement. And so it's also a call to action to reflect internally about the narratives we generate, about how it is that we pull, pull the triggers and, and leverage the levers. Um, and one thing, you know, as you were speaking and you were saying mainstream and we need to generate impact, I think actually the climate agenda does this really well. They brought that entire agenda down to one number. And you can say that one number, 1.5 degrees, and people know the impact, people know what it's about. So maybe it is just a case of what is that impact, that driver, that can't be counterweighed against other things like the media rights, like you know, other resistance forces. But that's easier said than done, of course. Um, and one person who is working on scale, on impact, on institutional reform, whether it be from the high level advisory board, the several panels um, that they've been on is uh, President Danilo Turk yourself. So in your experience, I know that the High Level Advisory Board also had extensive discussions on gender equality, <coughs> on how to include them in the global governance system and scale up some of the, the things that uh, Ms. Malcora and, and Ms. Helen Clark mentioned as well. So in the current reform agenda discussions, how do you believe the issue of gender equality is being addressed? And which direction would you like to see the agenda develop uh, sort of going into the global governance realm? Well, thank you. <clears throat> I'd be very happy to try to answer these questions. But before that, I'd like to make a few preliminary points. First, I was uh, described as a token man on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, that's very good, because I often participate in all-male panels, and they always start with lack of gender balance. <laughs> and what we have to seek is gender balance in all collective settings within the United Nations system gender balance is a principle. And it, really, it's not an artificial principle. I have worked in different collective settings, uh, you know, in different organizations, including at the United Nations, and I have seen that gender balance really creates a different dynamic and produces much better results than a lack of gender balance. So gender balance is really an important principle. Now, when it comes to high-level advisory board on effective multilateralism, we have <coughs> something like a gender balance there. This is a board of 12 members, seven of whom are women. And, and I think we have a very creative, very, you know, very 
inspiring discussions, and I hope you'll be able to come with something, something very serious at the end. I also would like to say that one needs to be optimistic about the process. You know, I, I think that we already live in, a, in an era of gender equality. This is the early stage of the era of gender equality in which we are living. I can say that on the basis of, again, my uh, long-term experience, obviously, uh, those of us who are interested in universal liberation of human rights learned from just the beginning that actually it came as a result of, uh, of work of Eleanor Roosevelt. And, and until today, that's the most balanced human rights instrument ever drafted. With, with everything is there. Civil, political, economic, and social rights, gender balance is there. With responsibility towards democratic societies, with the right of every person to a, to, a, to a social and international order in which all rights can be fully realized. That's also in the universal period. So, I mean, that platform is still very much there, and I think it's very real for, for real change. Then on the practical side, when I came to New York as permanent representative of Slovenia in 1992, there were seven female heads of mission that brought to them made together the first group which was called 7G, seven girls. And since one of them was Madeleine Albright, they became very influential. And they started to talk of personnel issues. And I can tell you that all other 180 heads of missions were extremely interested in learning what is on going on in the 7G group because you know that had an impact on, on, on what was going on. And that was an earlier phase of uh, the era of gender equality. Later, I traveled for the UN a lot as then Assistant Secretary General with Kofi Annan. And Kofi Annan, I can tell you, on every occasion, he used the metaphor saying, a bird with one wing cannot fly. That was his favorite. And uh, we were in Iran, and he was saying to the Iranian leaders, you know, you have to involve women as much as possible because otherwise you are like a bird with one wing, and a bird with one wing cannot fly. You have to use both wings. He was very proud when he could present in the CED meetings the leaders of different agencies, like Sadar Bogata, Mary Robinson, and others, who were already creating a sense of a different gender balance within the UN system. So things were going on. And on the terrain, I mean, I was in Mongolia once, and we gave a press conference, and all the journalists were women. Then I asked the, the, the Minister of Information, who was a man, I mean, how is that possible? I said, there's the thing that only women are interested in the UN, nobody else. And, no, no, without, in our country, most of the journalists are women, and most of other the professionals in the country are women already. So that's, the, that's social change. This is not limited to, to your press conference or to the UN. Then when I came back to New York, I discussed this experience with a number of people from different regions of the world, and everybody could tell a story which showed progress women are making with education. That's incredibly important because women can take advantage of education much better than men, and that, that, that's a hugely important transformative experience which, is, which can be empirically tested. So investing in education and giving girls opportunity to learn is, is fundamental. That, that, that uh, later on changes everything. So uh, what, uh, what I would like to say is let us be aware that we live in the era of gender equality and that era will have to bring new solutions everywhere. Now at the UN I think the two principles should apply. One of them is the principle of gender balance in all collective settings. Now, of course UN is an organization which has a few different forms of organization and of course one would have to figure out how to do it in different uh, different places. Uh, now I think that what, what Helen Clark has explained and what Susanna Marcora has explained, you know, gives a good sense of the direction which we should go and I would like really you and women to play a role in ensuring that the principle of gender balance is applied. Because it, it is a sound principle, it can be formulated as an organizational principle and it should be applied. <coughs> Of course, the more difficult question is how do you apply such a principle to offices which are single person offices. Now here in this group you will find three former candidates for the post of the Secretary General and uh, who were competing in 2016, I thought. <laughs> of course, the two others were saying, yes, the time for a female Secretary General has arrived. 
And I was saying, well, not necessarily, <laughs> which I think would be understood. Uh, but I also know, I mean, of course, this is not a substitute, but it is an important part of development that the female deputy secretary general have really prepared the terrain very well. Starting with Louise Frechette, and I have worked with Louise Frechette in my UN days, she was really a very powerful leader who could force, when necessary, decisions with an energy that, that most of the men were unable to mobilize. You know? and so, so to say that, that <coughs> the classic um, male uh, advantages such as experience, self-confidence, and these sort of things are not typical of women, that's nonsense. And I think the practice has shown that you know, on all these things, in experience, in self-confidence, uh, women can be very easily compared with men, and then when it comes to individual jobs, uh, that uh, that should be that should be kind of a cause. You know, that there's, there's no uh, there no real difference. And then, so what, one principle is gender balance. The other principle is gender sensitivity. Now, gender sensitivity is something we can include in all programming of the United Nations, and of course, progress is being made. Uh, in the high-level advisory board, we'll have to do it. We have various you know, themes, various ways in which we can do it. For example, we recently had a, one of the preparatory discussions for our next session, which was about organized crime. And after a while, we discovered that dealing with uh, human trafficking and the effect that it has on girls and women is essential if you want to come to a point in which you can say, all right, that's the policy to combat organized crime. You, you cannot devise a credible policy without having that aspect as the priority. And that came out as a discussion uh, which included men and women. And this, this was not a kind of a feminist sort of conclusion. This was a kind of a general conclusion. All right, so I think that uh, to put it very precisely, gender balance and gender sensitivity are two <coughs> fundamental principles which should be applied in the practice of the UN system as a whole, and that's the way forward. How that could be done in different specific sectors, specific policies, specific decisions that can be discussed. Uh, and let me then go back and conclude with something more general. You see, I, let, I like to tell you, it's a fashion of sometimes for men meeting in this sort of settings to declare themselves feminists. No, I'm not a feminist. I am a man, and I believe in gender. I believe in gender equality. I believe in, in gender balance. I believe in gender sensitivity, because we live in an era of gender equality. That era is already there. Uh, but you know, when um, I uh, read um, the kind of uh, the feminist slogan like uh, "Women need men like fish need spices." I am uh, kind of, uh, my, my, uh, my reaction to that is, well, how about bicycle needing fish? You know? <laughs> so we, we, we need each other. I mean, it's, it's a wrong slogan, I think. We, we need each other. And men, of course, will have to change their roles. And those changing of roles will not be easy for everybody. It is easy for me. I mean, I, my profession is teaching at the university. That's easy. But there are many professions where this is more difficult, and I think we have to be uh, careful about this in order to avoid misunderstandings and the political mobilization that comes as a result of misunderstandings. Uh, that is something to keep in mind. But that, of course, is not relevant to the UN. The UN, I think, is about gender balance and uh, gender sensitivity. circled back to, to the point that Dan made in the beginning of it's just humans being human. It's about creating shared value, um, sort of coming together. And there's a couple things that you mentioned, including uh, the feminist lens on peace and security, which sets me up brilliantly for my next speaker. But before um, we do, I just wanted to, to unpack, for example, you mentioned the importance of education. The Transforming Education Summit is happening just next door today, um, and I had the pleasure of being part of the Youth Mobilization Day, and I think that sort of brings, as you said, we're in an era of gender equality. Many of us, the younger ones in this room, myself included, grew up in that era of gender equality. We were born into that era of gender equality, but I think it's, a, as, as you mentioned, there's movement, there's traction, but it's, we've started the narrative, we've started the consultation, 
Um, and as Ms. Malcor and Ms. Helen Clark had mentioned, there's a long way to go. There's still a lot that needs to be done, and it's a multi-stakeholder process. It's about having everyone at the table, having everyone involved in the process. Um, and that includes civil society. That includes sort of the, um, as we've seen at the Transforming Education Summit next door, it was a youth-led movement, it was a civil society, inclusive in movement, movement, private sector was involved. I think the, the gender agenda is sort of like you can't just expect the UN to reform on its own overnight. I think it's an inclusive process. We saw the value of CSW that uh, Ms. Uh, Clark mentioned earlier, of uh, sort of the Beijing Action Platform. Um, and that brings me on to a lot of the work that um, Soon Young, you've been doing as well um, in terms of CSW leading several youth uh, platforms, the International Alliance of Women. Um, so, coming to you, what are the main sort of priorities in your eyes to ensure that key multilateral processes, such as the new agenda for peace that we've been discussing in the Our Common Agenda, the SDG Summit that we hope to see next year, and the Sustainable Development Goals, and the Summit of the Future, and um, with the Ministerial Summit now in 2023, and then the Summit itself in 2024, how can we ensure that all these sort of cross-cutting agenda items that we're progressing into, keeping in mind some of the challenges outlined earlier, can really incorporate gender equality and the woman's perspectives? And what are sort of some quick wins in that sense as well? Five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, in 1994, I was the liaison between the NGO Forum and the UN Forum for Conference on Women, and I was responsible for coordinating the regions, uh, regional focal points around an NGO amendments document, and we were determined that we would create a separate uh, statement from NGOs on that. That document, as you know, established the golden standard of policy. It introduced gender actually into the language of the UN for the very first time as, as part of its ongoing policy formation. And it took two years for that all to happen. And the most important part of that two years was in the regions. I wanted to tell you a little bit about my experience at the regional meeting in Amman. So I walked into the room and I was amazed to see that the government delegates many of whom were men, had two documents in front of them. One of them was the NGO document created by the Arab and Mina women's groups, and the other one was the official UN draft. And through the meeting, they lifted entire sections from the NGO document into their home. And at the end, what we had was one of the strongest statements on violence against women remember at that time that to talk about violence against women, gender-based violence at the UN, was considered a, a kind of private affair. And yet, this region was able to bring that forward. You remember that the African region brought in the whole child. Each region had its particular contribution. This was amazing. From that evolved what I can only say is a new paradigm a paradigm shift so that the final Beijing platform for action talked about a culture of peace. It's a culture of peace that we need to build in the home, in the community, as well as between nations. Yesterday at the GWL meeting, which is really an excellent meeting, the speaker spoke once again from that point of view. Weaving our personal security in the private sphere to multilateral policy. But at the UN, perhaps with the exception of those many, many UN Secure, uh, Security Council resolutions on women, peace, and security, most governments have not understood, understood how these are related. And this paradigm shift to culture, culture of violence, to values, is the unfinished business, I think, for the new agenda for peace, for the future, and for the SDG summits. So another critical paradigm shift, I think, is related to gender equality, health, and climate change. This morning I read a really <laughs> wonderful poem that the lines go, we are women, our place is in the home, and our home is the whole world. So we are part of a global ecology. Women and girls are more than 50% of the world's population, but we also occupy different places 
in that global ecology. And we can list them for you. The climate-related emergencies relied on women's unpaid work in the care economy. Food security in the Africa region is guaranteed by rural women who produce more than 70% food. Indigenous women are protecting our biodiversity and forests in Asia and Latin America. In industrialized countries, women's vote is helping to decide national policies on infrastructure, energy, and environmental protection. Underpaid and often underworked, 70% of the health service providers who are women are also put under extraordinary stress during climate-related emergencies. So if we are to fully participate to combat the effects of climate change, women must have equal social, legal, and economic rights. And here I return to the original point about gender-based violence. Gender-based violence, we know, is the root cause of the imbalance of power relations because it deprives us of our freedoms, our freedoms, freedom to get an education, to work where we want, and even to run for public office. I was interested in an IPU survey that found that many women in politics, something like more than 35% of those surveyed, had faced threats of rape, specifically sexual violence. And the women mayors that I have spoken uh, to have talked about more threats to their children and families than to their male colleagues. So what are the challenges ahead? I like the phrasing of a WHO new uh, publication, which I believe President Turk has even contributed to, called Health is a Political Choice. Health is a Political Choice. And this should <coughs> apply to the interrelationship that we need to see between a healthy self, a healthy society free from violence, and a healthy planet. So when young activists from the environment movement ask me what they can do as individuals, I say vote. When my feminist friends ask me what they can do for climate change, I say please vote. So we put the wrong political leaders in place, and they throw our movement into reverse by pulling out of the Paris Accord, withdrawing funding from the NFPA, denigrating the Human Rights Council. And we put the right people in place. They defend our women's human rights, labors for health care, and climate justice. Our health and our healthy planet is a political choice. So another challenge, I think, is to change the UN's mindset about the feminist, and I use that word to include men, <laughs> and women's movement as a force for a stronger UN. There's much talk these days of a fractured multilateralism, seeming threat to global cooperation, but there are counter forces that are balancing this trend. And these are the progressive international, intergenerational social movements we see in the streets. At the NGO Forum in 1994, one of our mottos was weaving the world's women together as all issues. And I believe that's exactly what we are doing. We are actually working across borders in every country and weaving across the tribal lines of indigenous people's societies. As the women's major group, feminist analysis of our common agenda put it, and this is a quote from that document, we women believe that this is a critical time for asserting the importance of rights-based multilateralism and the need for global solidarity. The point is, feminist and women's movement is to be a pillar of men's strength. We can help weave the world together. And in that group, I include our colleagues in government and inside the UN who are working with us. So the UN really needs to be more open to scale up innovations, many of which are coming from the regions. And I think that we need to open up more spaces for women mayors. Women mayors, not just parliamentarians, but statewide because we know that by 2030, we will be 60% women and girls in cities. Cities are the main polluters, but they're also the centers of innovation. And they can measure what we call intersectionality. That is, they can measure very quickly and sometimes more accurately the impact of that innovation on different parts of the women's population in cities. Yet we know that worldwide, only 17% of the world's mayor I was happy to see that 25% of the major capitals are actually run by women, including Andrea Telkin's Paris. So let's find better ways, 
even though they are civil society, to make sure that the mayors are, um, in, are part of our group. And finally, I emphasize that when the UN is siloed, we as women's movement also struggle to unite. There is still too large a divide separating New York, Geneva, Vienna, and Nairobi. And even though in the digital world this is likely to narrow, if we make this one of the goals for UN reform, I think we will help the movement itself. So we do, one of my organizations, helps convene the women's constituency at the COP, who will be in Egypt, but we also help facilitate the women's major group at the HLDF. And we see the gaps. We see the potential of innovation that can come from building bridges across social movements. But we need the UN to do its part, because when it fractures itself, we are also in different places, unable to connect. There are gaps between the regional mandates and the global mandates. The CSW is stronger in the regions, in Latin America and Caribbean. The women NGOs actually unite with governments and a single statement coming to CSW, and it falls apart at the local level. Which is why we have called for, from the NGO CSW in New York, representation of NGOs in the negotiations at CSW. Unless we have that, CSW will no longer matter to us. We will just have, we had 35,000 people last year online. We will just work in parallel. But will we carry the responsibility for the agreed conclusions across to HLPF, across to COP, and to GA? It's not. Thank you. And thank you, Sino, for, for almost flipping the narrative. You know, I mentioned the decision-making table and sat around the table today. But I think it's interesting to potentially problematize the idea that there is a central decision That people who want to, you know, be a part of the conversation have to join the central decision-making table. <coughs> whether it be in the UN, whether it be in other pockets of power. But actually, you know, networking that, that sort of structure of change, recognizing that change happens in pockets, whether it be at a sort of council level as it were, at a mayor level, whether it be at a state level, regional level. It's not a central decision-making table. It's rather a network of change-making mechanisms that will lead to a progressive move. So it's not about, you know, we hear often sayings of, oh, if they don't give you a seat at the table, pull up a chair, no, just go make your own table, you know? It's not about having to feel, um, having to be at that, that sort of central fora all the time. And I think that you exemplified that through several examples, um, whether it be the regional work of CSW, whether it be sort of each individual voting to make a change, whether it be the sort of mayors of, of different cities, and the paradigm shift that that can potentially cause in culture as a whole. So at the end of this first round of discussions, we've discussed, sort of started with a narrative of going from the, um, the building of the narrative of the, of the equality movement to how inclusion sort of started coming about, the consultative process and partnerships, but recognizing that there's been a resistance to getting to this stage of leadership, to getting, so we're getting there, but it's not quite, you know, where we need it to be, and some of what we might need to do to be sort of getting to that next stage of this movement includes mainstreaming, it includes impact and sort of really vocalizing that impact in ways that, that sort of hit home with, with some of the key resistors to change, knowing where the resistance nodes are in, coming from for the movement, whether that be at the UN, whether that be at other international um, organizations, and part of moving past that resistance includes principles such as gender balance, includes including principles such as gender sen sensitivity. But we also discussed institutional triggers and how that can catalyze action, including, for example, just thinking about where you're spending money, where you're allocating resources, um, who it is that you sort of require as a bare minimum to be on uh, consideration for a job, and, and how these these little triggers, those sort of not to scale, can help push push the envelope and continue catalyzing the narratives, even if only at the margins. But all in all, we are in an era of gender equality. Many of us have had the privilege of being born into an era of gender equality. But it still requires a paradigm shift in culture. It still requires, especially when we think about the cross-sectional impact 
impacts. You know, over the coming week, we're going to be discussing not just the gender equality agenda, we're going to be thinking about climate change, we're going to be thinking about peace and security, which is at the forefront of many people's minds, and um, the impact of sort of socio-economic, of cultural, of, of other agendas, and I think just Soon Young, what you highlighted about having that gender lens across all of these agendas and the impact that it has across those agendas is so crucial and important. So with sort of that, that framing that you've provided in, in the initial round of questions, I have one final question for the panel before we open the discussion to the floor. And my hope is that it's, it's one question to all of you, and my hope is that you will each build off of your responses um, to both set up the stage for the dialogue and also leave time for it at the end. But it's, I think, especially with the gender movement and based off of what everything you've said, it's about little changes and little triggers and building off each other and building off moments and opportunity windows that are provided, um, that are provided to us. So in that essence, to exemplify the cause, um, I'll start us off with, with a question to all of you, and, and Ms. Clark, I'll come to you first. What are the key transformative actions and improvements that are needed in the UN system to accelerate progress in gender equality within and beyond the UN system? And just to add to that question a little bit more is, you know, we're headed into UNGA 77. What are some quick wins that you could see as outcomes coming out of this, this sort of week ahead that you think is a sign of success, a sign of, yes, there's been progress made this year? I think over time, many small steps can add up to transformational change if they're all you know, running in the right direction. So it's not one swing of the wheel here, right? There's many things building, and we've talked about some of them already as you have summarised. Uh, secondly, it, it, you know, changes in the UN system uh, to keep gender equality at, at the forefront, front and centre are important, but it's what happens in member states that in the end is really going to make the major difference. So that brings me to really the, the UN's moral authority, the leadership role in its, its different um, uh, components uh, at country level, uh, you know, upholding the, the normal standards and values around gender equality. And I think what is transformative is that we have great agendas, but you know, the international community is great at negotiating great agendas and then putting them on the shelf. And we're just about halfway through the SDG period. And we're failing on every single one of them. <laughs> Wake up call. You know, and, and we had these terrible setbacks with COVID and now the spillover impacts of the war in Ukraine. Devastating for women. So many more women thrown into deep poverty uh, with, with, with the pandemic. Uh, so many more into in hunger. UNESCO's estimate that 11 million girls would never return to school after the lockdowns of 2020. Domestic violence rates uh, uh, soaring, sexual and reproductive health uh, services uh, dysfunctional of about 40% of the countries surveyed by the WHO during the pandemic. So it's a huge recovery job to do to get back on track with the transformational agenda, which is the SDGs. And I would hope that one of the things that would register this, this year at the UNGA is that next year when people come to the SDG summit, marking sort of just over the halfway mark of 2030, that they realise <laughs> That this great agenda risks failure unless they really get moving. And the recovery agenda needs tremendous international solidarity because the low income countries are completely out of fiscal space. They use what they had from the pandemic. They can't borrow anymore. You know, recovery is slow. Uh, Western consumer confidence declined. That, that's had an impact on, on tourism, on many of, many of the things that uh, people look to to, to to generate recovery. So yeah, I, I think the key message, get back on track with the transformational agenda. The SDGs, the climate agenda, the climate agenda has taken a terrible knock with the war in Ukraine. And instead of everyone making a sort of beeline for the energy transition, what are we doing? Firing up the nuclear, uh, up the power stations, the coal-fired power stations. So this is all, all crazy. So uh, <laughs> women's voices, of course, are very important in getting transformational change and I think as women we need to rally behind the agendas we've got and uh, the message out to the UN organisations has to be stick your head up in country, advocate with governments. Governments have signed up to all these things. Everyone signed on to Paris, everyone signed up to the SDGs, but it's easy to marginalise these agendas when 
dealing with other other immediate issues. And Susanna rightly um, mentioned uh, Resolution 1325. You know, one of the uh, UN resolutions most honoured in the breach, not the observance. I mean, here we have in front of us the most horrific conflicts. And let's just instance the one in Tigray and the one in Ukraine, as they call it, long, sad lists, where uh, rape is being used as a weapon of war. Does the Security Council pronounce on this? Does it uphold uh, 1320? No. I mean, th this is outrageous. And if we want, yeah, if, we, if we want to transform all forms of action, we need our institutions to perform uh, to to uphold these standards and values. So that would be my point. Thank you so much. And in the essence of sort of each speaker building on each other, I will refrain here and come back at the end. So this will pour us straight to you. Thank you, Mahara. You know, listening to colleagues here looking at the audience nodding, it's clear that we are preaching to the converters. <laughs> <laughs> so the challenge is how to cross the bridge. Because there are many on the other side of the bridge. We need to recognize that. And, and for me, the case for half the population being fully empowered is so simple so obvious that one tends to argue why is it that it's not happening? Mm. You know, different studies have shown that the GDP of countries will grow 18, 21, 20, I mean 25 percent depending on the study. I mean, we are talking about not a zero-sum game here. We are talking about a proposition that brings growth to the, growth to the table. But there is a minute tail behind all of this, which is called power. <laughs> <laughs> and my concern is that most of the time we shy away to talk about power. And this is at the center of a problem. Yes, it's true that creating a new table brings an additional perspective. It is true that if you add a, 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 a civil society network, it helps. All of that is true. But in the end, we need to crack power. And we need to do it in a manner, from my perspective, and I fully agree with, with Danilo when he says, let's be careful with these men versus women. This is us, mm -hmm. us with a different perspective. But what we need to be able to convey is that this is not a zero-sum game, that there is an opportunity to grow the pie, that we can all win out of this. And we have been totally unsuccessful in this regard. So for me, it's absolutely central that at the country level, as Helen said, because that's where the UN can really make an impact, but also across the street, we start to talk about real power, about how that real power can grow for all, we all participate, and how shaping power with a fair representation of 50% of the population will bring a new type of power, which hopefully will create that world that we all was describing. So let's not shy away from that. Let's talk power. Let's talk about elections. Let's talk about women's participation. We just had as GDF, GWL, a, a report prepared, I mean, a, 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 a research done by a, a, a researcher that shows that when you have women in power, the policies on gender-based violence are much better. But not only that, if you have women in the justice system, the application of those policies are much better. And interestingly enough, the correlation was not, and this is all really proven, not so much about the leaders in the executive, but the participation in, in a, a parliaments because that's where the real difference starts. 
ending with adjustment. So this is power. Well, I agree with you. Let's go and vote, and vote right. Thank you so much. Thank you for those powerful remarks. Um, I will now hand over to President. Well, uh, actually, it's easy to agree with the two decisions. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to invent something very new or add something very new, except that I can try to build on what we said both my uh, Susanna. You see, the, there will be opportunities. My first point is that the coming period, starting with this assembly, brings new opportunities to introduce or to integrate rather the gender sensitivity in everything, in all policy aspects that will be on top of the agenda. Nations. It will obviously have to do with SDGs uh, for the next year. And SDGs obviously is not only about the goal on women. SDGs is about all 17 goals. And of course, it's, it, 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 this is a difficult task, a serious task, to figure out how to introduce the aspect of gender sensitivity in a meaningful way in all of this, uh, uh, all of this uh, uh, sustainable development. Then the question of the youth office, which will be established, and it's a big step forward. The question is then, how do you define the role of youth office in supporting gender equality? And because youth office is not only about age. Youth office is about transformation in an intergenerational understanding. You know, the future will be different than the past. The future is not going to be continuation, let alone repetition. It would be different. And that is why we need young people's voices to tell us, all right, how would you like to see that future look? Different future. And again, gender equality is part of that. I mean, I'm sure that that will be very easy to conclude. And then that has to be translated into specific tasks. Education was already mentioned, and I don't want to into that again. The question of the uh, second social world social summit, which was proposed and which Secretary General accepted for the year 2025. Now, of course, it is not in the forefront today, but it will come back, I think, very naturally in the course of discussion of the SDGs and the summit of the future. We'll have to look at the question of social development, which is uh, which is present uh, everywhere. I can tell, uh, tell you an example, uh, and uh, among other things, I'm. Uh, uh, by a member of an advisory board of the Guao Forum for Asia, which is really you know, a hardcore economic thing. And uh, we had a discussion last Thursday, uh, which was essentially about decarbonization. <laughs> so the whole discussion focused after you know, a bit of a general introduction, decarbonization. And after a big debate on decarbonization, the question of social development came up because the Chinese society is aging the transformation of population will require transformation of policy. And transformation of policy includes all kinds of things. You know, one child policy has a huge impact and of course moving to a next phase to some, some sort of a meaningful gender balance, gender sensitive policy will be a big thing for China and that's uh, to some extent recognized already. I'm using this as an example which is recent. That is the only reason for, for <coughs> using it is that recent experience, you know, you start with the kind of general economic crisis, you, you figure out that decarbonization is really critical, but then soon after you come to the social development and the role of women, everywhere. So I think that this integration of gender sensitivity in all these important policy making discussions in which UN will play a big role, we should not be kind of discouraged by the current marginalization of UN because of the war with Ukraine. I mean, that's obviously very convenient, but you know, the moment you start to discuss something serious, you are this back, and, and we have the opportunity. So I think that that's something to, to, to do. Now, uh, then of course, uh, what uh, Susanna said, I mean, to explain this whole process of change, not as a kind of a women being a sort of a trade union, you know, fighting for its rights, and it's not like that. It, it's about growing the pie and making things better for everybody. That, that's why, I mean, we talk about, about gender-sensitive aspects of development. 
And, and that, of course, is the argument that should be developed further into, uh, into specific objectives, specific figures, specific things. You know, that, that's something that has to come now. And as I said, this coming in three years will be really quite interesting in that regard because you will have so many opportunities to, to change, change the approach, make it more adequate to the era of gender equality. And then finally, you see, there are some difficult things which I am not sure how they can be overcome. Take, for example, the uh, 25 Resolution Act to Women and Art Politics. Of course, the big uh, uh, improvement in this discussion in the past has been to accept that women are not only victims of art conflict, but that women can be great agents of movement for peace. Of that, of course, has not succeeded yet. But I think that the basic uh, truth is that, that women have to be given the space for, for you know, creating peace. Now, that's not easy, because if one listens to Ursula von der Leyen, a woman who is chairing the European Commission today, she is probably the most bellicose person talking about the war in Ukraine. Today, she is speaking only about victory, not about peace. The agenda today is victory in a war. That comes uh, most visibly in the whole European Union setting from a woman on the top of the executive branch of the European Union. I am not accusing her, probably she's right. War is something very ugly and you know, it's not, there is no simple answer to any of these things. But again, let us not start with simplistic views that you know, we just put the women in the place and then automatically things will move towards peace. I mean, we know that from past experience, it's not that simple as that. And there has to be progress in that regard. And, and, and how that progress will go, I don't know, and I don't think anybody knows. We'll have to go through many discussions to come to a better understanding. Thank you. optimistic, remembering that the women's movement, the movement for gender equality is one of the most powerful nonviolent social movements of modern time. And we are all a part of that. So practically speaking, money. <laughs> so money. Looking for innovative ways to fund those social movements. How do we do that? I think, I think we haven't taken enough opportunity to look at the innovations that are happening at the end. So if we start listing the innovations, the one that stands out to me is the Generation Equality Forum. Generation Equality Forum took the UN agenda outside the intergovernmental process so that governments could actually work together in groups, Mexico and France leading, UN women supporting, and in the six action coalitions, which includes everything from women's leadership, my organization, we do as one of the co-leaders for environment, the Global Compact on Women, Peace, and Security lost. It did not become the seven. Why? Because of, uh, well, that is, that is a recent project for you to do. The peace and security issue is the one that needs the most funding. And I talked about culture, and I think one of the things that Generation Equality Forum is was a chance to bring culture into the stakeholders. So who are the culture makers in our society? They are not just artists and the occasional film star that we bring to the UN. They are journalists. They are creating the language in which we interpret nature. They are the ad people. They are the corporations. These people are creating the meaning that we see, from which we see each other, and from which we see nature. So I would add to the Generation Equality Forum and to the agenda of the OCA, much more importance paid to the stakeholders who are shaping our commercial culture and our gender culture. Thank you. Thank you. I think you both 
comes back nicely as well to this question of mainstream. And one of the ways to mainstream is cultural innovation, is, is sort of identifying those norm entrepreneurs that trigger change. So thank you so much for that. And just to, before we go on to our Q&A session for the last sort of 10 minutes of this discussion, what we'll do is we'll go around the room for questions and then I'll ask the panelists to provide sort of concluding thoughts and answers to the questions. But just to very quickly from sort of um, my humble perspective as a young person, um, pick up the question that Danilo Turk, uh, President Turk, you, you mentioned and, and Ms. Malcora, you said talk about power um, as well. I think the UN Youth Office is a statement that young people are moving past intergenerational dialogue and ready for intergenerational partnerships. It's a statement that um, the UN has to provide some power to, to the youth of the world today, that it's a part of sort of moving forward. And I think it's important, as you said, to, to bring the gender perspective into this. Because one of the phases of power, it, of power is in fact no, not even knowing that you lack it. You know, oftentimes you see, whether it be in, in cases of domestic violence, whether you see in cases of injustices, I mean, just yesterday a woman in Iran was harassed because of her religious identity or, or you know, not a fitting to, to someone's ideal of a religious identity. I think it's this not even knowing sometimes where the power structures lie is in itself um, sort of an abuse of power. So I think we're hoping that the intergenerational forces, that the, the feminist forces, that including men and women and all others, um, really do come together to push change in sort of the weeks ahead and, and the years ahead and um, leading into the 20. 2030 Agenda, 2025 Summits into the future. I will now open the floor to any questions or comments, and then we'll go around the room quickly, pick some up, and then we'll come back to our panelists. So I see one, two, three, four, five, six. Brilliant. Rosa. <laughs> and if we could please keep them sort of very brief so that we can fit in the responses and the questions. Well, thank you very much. My name is, is Rosa Malango. Um, I have the privilege of having served with the United Nations for 28 years now. I've served as a resident coordinator under Helen Clark, um, and I was kind of a mentor under Kofi Annan and, and Ban Ki Moon. So thanks to the shortlisting, I became a resident coordinator. So it works. <laughs> um, there was there are just two things that I, I wanted to put here. Now that I've had the privilege of being brought back to headquarters, um, I'm now head of the, the secretariat for the regional commissions uh, in New York. So I'm looking at everything from the economic and the regional platforms um, lens. Two things that come to my mind, number one is I keep asking, are we really discussing about the knowledge and power architecture? Thank you, Susanna, for mentioning it. We skip around and around and around. This is about knowledge and this is about power. And if we don't discuss those two architectures, we start getting lost um, in, 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 I don't know where, in the, in the woods. The other thing is um, I heard the discussion about the role of UN women. And I heard about the need to document uh, good practices. We have so many. We have a campaign on positive masculinity. We've been running out. We have the he for she. But what shocks me is that while we put all that energy and we spend all that energy in the power corridors at the national level and at the regional level to get it to adopt, when I come here, I don't see it. Here is the General Assembly. They're not discussing he for she. They're not discussing the, the positive masculinity. They're not discussing any of the things. So we are beginning to have a crisis of credibility with the member states. Rosa, why are you stressing me to change my policies and my financing? If when I go to General Assembly, it doesn't matter. So what, do we, what is the purpose of, of, of the change? My last point is, I believe the common agenda is an opportunity to keep the UN Charter alive. Mm -hmm. And I believe that if we want to be successful about the gender movement, we have to be successful about the people's movement. Because it's about gender, but it's about race, it's about religion, and it's about nationality. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, again, I'm going to go around the room and if you could keep your questions super brief, thank you so much, Rosa. Um, that would be brilliant so that we can uh, turn back to our panelists. Joshua Lincoln. Hello, Joshua Lincoln from the Fletcher School. Um, I'm former Secretary General of the Baha'i International Community and also former UN staff member. And, uh, this has brought a lot of flashbacks to moments on the 38th floor of difficult firsts. Um, it, it can seem silly now to think about how hard it was to get one name on a list of three for, 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 for a short list. And I'm glad we moved on from, from that or to have difficult discussions about whether it was time to fire somebody for the very first time in a very prominent position for falling short on this agenda. 
Um, as we think about the future of, govern of global governance, one of the ways to think about it is that the institutions that were created after the Second World War to manage complicated problems now have to face complex problems. And so there, there are, in a way, two agendas. The one we've been discussing today and the one about the transformation that is required for us to keep pace. So I'm, I'm interested in any thoughts you have on how these two agendas come together as we look at the last two years of giving us a master class on complexity and education that it will be. Thank you so much. And would you mind just yeah. introducing yourself and then posing a quick question? Yeah, I'm, I'm Jeff Feltman. I was the Undersecretary General for Political Affairs from 2012 to 2018, working with, with those of Daniel Cora and Helen Clark. And I want to raise the 1325 agenda in terms of peace and, peace and security. Because the UN has achieved a lot, um, at, thanks to member states, thanks to leadership inside the UN, when it comes to peace and security 1325, there, the SRSGs must report on 1325 for the to the Security Council. Large missions have, have gender advisors in the negotiation processes like mediation support. Um, Sam I came for mediation um, support. We include gender expertise and all of that. It doesn't matter if the member states never ask about it. If you go to the Security Council, you go to the Security Council behind closed door for consultations, at least during my experience, I can count on one hand the number of times that 1325 came up. Sometimes we'll come up in, in the chamber because that was done for public audience. But um, SRSGs will take their cue from what the Security Council members are most interested in talking to them about, and 1325 rarely comes up. So the problem really is less the leadership of the UN and more how we get the member states of the UN to follow the cue of the UN in my view. Thank you so much. Um, I had a question back here. Yes. Hello, everybody. I'm Amanda Ellis, former New Zealand ambassador to the UN. Can you speak up, please? Sorry. Just a little bit. Kia from Aotearoa, New Zealand. I'm Amanda Ellis. I was New Zealand Ambassador to the UN in Geneva from 2013 to 16, and also the founder of the Women, Business and the Law Project at the World Bank. I wanted to come back to this uh, question of knowledge and power. I was very naive and thought once we'd documented all of the laws that impacted women's ability to be economically active, change would immediately follow. Here we are in 2022. Not a single country has yet achieved full gender equality. And only 12, all of them in Europe, apart from Canada, have actually legislated for full gender equality. So I wanted to say thank you to this brilliant panel and ask your advice on how we actually move this agenda forward. I understand that legislative rights are a necessary but not sufficient condition, but how do we address Susanna's point about power and Helen's point about everyone signed on to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and also SDG 5. How do we actually get movement? Thank you so much. Any questions over there? Yeah. Hi, my name is Samyukta. I'm um, an Australian student of law from um, NYU. I feel deeply privileged to have lawfully swindled my way into this room with all these incredible speakers and people today. Um, so my question is, I fully understand that um, a lot of the international instruments that we currently have today protecting women's rights are incredibly important and are uh, very normatively useful for the goals that we are trying to reach. However, it did come to my attention, especially when I was studying these instruments in more detail, that it seems that international instruments do seem to use uh, gender equality and equality for women um, against the framework or against the comparator of of men. So gender equality seems to be women being equal to men. And as we know, men are not perfect, neither is the male standard. So I wanted to know, is there a way out of this? Do the speakers think that this is just, I guess, uh, an unfortunate, um, uh, uh, the way that we do have to frame international instruments, or is there a way that we can change the foundation of our language, or is there something that we need to do more deeply, structurally, to change this? Thank you so much. Uh, there was three more questions, I think, one, two, three, so, <laughs> yes. so um, we're going to, if you could please keep it just, you know, just the questions so that we can okay. get to the... Okay, you said questions or comments. Just, just the question. <laughs> so, okay, so thank you all the presenters, all the panels are wonderful. And uh, so I'm Kim Macho from Cornell University, a professor. So I'm a global nutrition and food system specialist. So when we have, uh, when we look at the city here and talking about globally and uh, the, all the initiatives activity, I would say one point, that's uh, uh, the, the discrep, uh, I mean, not one discrep, the, the gaps between the, the global level and also when you go down to the local level. 
because keeping in touch with me, with all the international uh, scientists and civil society from all over the world, Africa, Asia, Latin America. So within two years, we can travel everywhere. We have all the documents and science findings and everything. The main difference is talking about the, uh, the, uh, um, the uh, society, healthy society, healthy environment, healthy planet. To contribute this, how do we really keep our women and men really secure food? And without food security, we cannot find any peace. Thank you so, so that's much. why peace and culture. Thank you. And even thank you here, we have a seven, eight men, so over 30 women. Thanks for the men in this room. Thank you. And uh, so that's really, thank we you. need uh, really uh, I'm, culture. I'm very sorry, but I've you clocked the time and I do want to go back to our panel but I'm sure you know there's we're going to be in the room after this so please do feel free to come up to the panel as I said this is the beginning of a conversation for the week ahead by no means is it going to satisfy or culminate so we heard about the purpose of change the agendas of complexity versus complication um, agenda visibility and so much more I request the panelists to each choose sort of one thing that they that really stood out to them to to answer that question and again that this is the beginning of a conversation. Um, so, Ms. Clark, over to you. Well, two, two quick points. Yeah. Firstly, we have the normative framework and we have the transformational agendas. What we need is action and we need accountability. I think that's where civil society's role is so, so vital to hold people to what they committed to. And they committed to all these great things, so hold them accountable. My second point would be responding to the Australian student uh, uh, and the point you made about uh, do we really want you know, to be like men, as it were. Uh, answer, no, we don't want their heart attacks, stress, and other conditions, right? We want to be able to uh, li live our lives as we want to live them. But, but you know, equality means we've got to have equal access to the opportunities, the positions, and, and everything else as well. And then we, then we make our own choices. But it, it's not to, to replicate to, you know, the, the lifestyles of men which haven't been so attractive. Thank you so much, Mr. Mark. It's not correct. Very briefly, first on hope, looking around the table, looking around the back pictures, so many young women so engaged, and some men, that gives me hope. So this is a journey. We need to keep working. We need to keep pushing. And in, as long as in the hands of the younger generation, I see that interest, I have hope. That's the first thing. I fully agree with you, Jeff. One thing is what we get approved, and another one is member states embracing it. Same thing that uh, Helen referred to with the SDG, even climate change is uh, to a certain extent. Let me go back to New Zealand and the question on, on knowledge and, and power. We just need to be more present. And you know, there is a minimum percentage that you need to have in a group to have influence. Mm -hmm. People talk about 30 percent. We are far below that in many, many places. So that is what we need. We need that in, 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 in parliaments, election process. We need that in the judiciary to go to the accountability point that Helen made. Yes, it's true that the civil society can play a big role, but you need the hard judiciary system calling accountable. So let's just push for the space. Let's push for quotas where quotas are not there. Let's push for affirmative action. No other way. Thank you so much, Sophia. Yeah, well, um, three things. First, um, you know, my experience, one of my first international conferences related to the women conference in uh, Mexico in 1975. That's a little bit of my back and, uh, and at that time, it was already quite clear among the NGO activists, if you all that were at the time, that obviously we are talking not about the rights of women versus men. We talked about transformation of society as a whole. And that, that's fundamental and has to be, has to be maintained and developed in specific programs or specific, specific tasks. Secondly, um, how to move from promise to action. You see, the UN, I think one of the things that the UN has done is 
to the previous decades back is this connection between what happens at the UN and civil society mobilization within countries. That's really a much more powerful opportunity than is usually recognized. I mean, the standards, the criteria that the UN develops can be a formidable tool for NGOs, for civil society organizations within countries. And I believe that in this coming few years, there will be a lot to do in that direction. To, to help civil societies to, to articulate their policies, their approach, uh, so as to move things closer to the standards and objectives uh, developed by the UN. And third, on the uh, women and peace, it's true that Security Council members may not be particularly interested. But again, there, that's where the gender sensitivity comes in as an obligation for the Secretary General. The Secretary General writes reports on every situation. It's not a kind of just a technical transfer, transit from the special representative to the Security Council. No, Secretary General has his own role. And he can always say in his report that something is wrong and that something that needs to be discussed and that solutions need to be found. So I think that that's clearly for the Secretary General and his advisors in New York to do, simply as gender sensitivity the uh, basic organizational principle. Uh, that's how I think uh, everybody has to work, and the Secretary General is not an exception. Thank you so much, Ms. and Ms. Tia. Right, so I'm um, a normative side. So I think we have five, <laughs> only five, bright lights. We have Beijing Platform for Action. I would like to add the new urban agenda to make sure we pay attention to cities as policy guides. We have two treaties that are really important for women, CEDAW and UNFCCC. And then we have the SDG targets. Those are five bright lights, normative frameworks with global consensus. What we don't have is them working together at the local level. And I think that's a task for governments. I think that's a task for all politicians. It's a task for civil society as well. To answer President Turk's question about the SDG targets and how to bring the gender equality into that, if we string these together, we will find that those missing targets can be interpreted through CEDAW. And every country that agreed to the SDGs also signed CEDAW. Thank you so much to all our panelists. from the room. Again, I welcome you to allow this to be the beginning of a conversation that you go and take away to your meetings this week, take away to your countries, to your experiences going forward. Um, and thank you once again, a round of applause for our panelists, to those in the room. For being